at the beginning of man's intellectual life, <clears throat> he depended almost entirely upon communication by word and example. Our earliest known forms of education were close to what we term apprenticeship. The individual simply learned by doing, by observing, and by following the patterns of his tribe. At this time, formal education as we know it could not exist. The individual unfolded into the maturity of his people, following their courses of action, inspired by their concepts and convictions, and his way is still preserved to us in the earliest periods of human life, the child, prior to the beginning of schooling, recapitulates the whole theory of ancient learning. He learns by becoming aware of the world around him and the circumstances under which he must gradually develop a pattern for living. With the invention of the written word, an entirely different situation arose, which was to affect not only the culture of man, but most directly and immediately his own internal life. The written word began with pictoglyph, in which the individual attempted to draw a picture of his ideas. These pictures were derived almost totally from nature around him and he was therefore limited in his inability to, met, to represent qualities which were intangible or for which there was no immediate natural symbol available. Gradually, however, he became acutely aware that he could transfer from one person to another a certain implication of qualities by the careful selection of his symbols. He learned, for example, that animals have certain characteristics reminiscent of human beings, and he could convey not only the person's appearance or physical propensities, but some of these overtones by involving a more penetrating analysis of the symbol that he used. From the true pictoglyphic or pictographic form of writing, he passed to the hieroglyph, and here he began the development of compound phrases, words, sentences, and began to use pictures to represent arbitrary letters of the alphabet. Thus spelling came to him, and from spelling gradually hieroglyph moved in her, into the hieratic forms in which the glyphs were gradually reduced to stenographic symbols from which we now have our alphabets. Now this entire process imposed upon man the need to learn to read. It was essential to him that he should share with others in the common knowledge of a series of characters, figures, symbols, devices, only when he shared these in common could he receive the benefit of common knowledge. Thus came reading. Reading also implied for the first time a period set aside for learning. Up to that time the child or the person simply grew and learned simultaneously. He grew while he learned, he played while he learned. Gradually, however, it was necessary for him to set aside a certain period of time in which to master this mysterious alphabet. It was not long before this became an involvement, and gradually there arose teachers, professional instructors in this simple procedure. They were sometimes called scribes or they may have been early in the way of things, merely priests or medicine 
uh, teachers, healers, anyone who had this knowledge might transmit it. Under the Roman educational theory, parents were presumed to teach their children these basic instruments, and the child was not expected to go under professional tutoring until after he had mastered the rudiments of his three R's. Thus what we call primary education was for the most part still in the keeping of the family. We look back and we assume therefore that the Romans must have had more leisure than we had, that they had the time to take to give their children the advantages of education. Today, however, with all our labor-saving and time-saving devices, it would seem that we have less time than the ancient Roman, less time than the ancient Greek, and far less time than the ancient Chinese. We no longer, apparently, feel that we have the necessary leisure to devote to education. As this condition gradually increased, and we find the activities of the individual taking precedence over the instruction of the young, the lesser schools, the primary school concept came into being. And by degrees, we developed a theory of education that was founded essentially upon man's ability to read. Now what is the difference essentially between observation and experience as primitive man knew these things, and the transferring or communicating of information through the art of reading. For the first, of course, we realize that between experience and the individual to receive it, a new instrument has been interposed between actual fact and actual desire to know has come this massive structure of what might be termed the intellectual middleman, the process of learning, by which the individual get, gradually gains control of the instruments and tools of his race, by which he is assumed to achieve a condition of education. We are now in this peculiar situation that for several thousands of years, nearly all civilized peoples have been taught to read. They have been taught, therefore, that their most perfect means of communication, actually, is the written word, which not only makes available to them news in the sense of contemporary happening, but history in the sense of remote happening. <clears throat> Today, therefore, reading perpetuates for us that which the past could never know. Reading has also, to a degree, standardized the descent of knowledge. Knowledge passed on only by oral tradition was subject to constant change without censorship. Each generation added something or detracted something. And the final result of traditional knowledge was often confused, as we know from mythology which undoubtedly originated on an historical or philosophical level, but has gradually descended to folklore through perpetuation without control. Reading, however, if it has served us well, has also produced a curious psychic condition within the heart and mind of the reader. Gradually, he has come to associate ideas with words, he has also, in time, ultimately come to the substitution of word for idea. And this becomes a very serious problem. No adequate testing is available, but such indications as have accumulated would cause us to assume that for modern man, word and idea are practically synonymous terms. In other words, any statement in words becomes a statement in fact, if we think we know this is not true. But in common experience, we do not think that deeply. Therefore, we accept it as true. Therefore, we ask a question which involves within ourselves ideas. We read an answer, 
uh, which probably <clears throat> inferred to the person who gave it to us in written form also an idea. But in communication, we have only words. And gradually, we come to accept a written definition or a series of word statements for dynamic facts. These words going into the mental equipment and meeting there the question that was asked. These words seem to answer the question. Therefore, we accept the answer in the term of a phrase, a statement, a definition, a truism. And before we know what has happened, we discover that our own thinking has become word thinking. When we ask ourselves a question, we answer with a mental word concept. By degrees, the substitution of word concept for idea concept within ourselves has taken the vitality out of the answer. It has left us with nothing but formulas, formulas which seem to satisfy certain intellectual needs. But these formulas are not always accompanied by an experienced dynamic. In other words, we do not feel, know, or experience the meaning of the word. To meet this problem, a number of dictionaries have come into existence. Dictionaries, among the first being Minshew's Guide to Tongues, that was printed about 400 years ago, dictionaries help us. But all they can do is give us usage. <clears throat> Johnson and Webster both acknowledge that a dictionary does not tell us the meaning of a word. It only tells us the usage. It tells us how other persons have used this word and in what context. We then make another important discovery, and that is that words are comparatively meaningless out of context. We cannot simply take the word alone and make it live. It lives in a pattern. It must therefore be qualified by other words. Until gradually, we gain a total concept of the, the original word picture that someone attempted to convey. Now, as a word out of context lose meaning, loses meaning, it does not necessarily mean that it develops an inaccurate meaning. It develops what we might term a static meaning. It has a meaning which cannot be denied, but which is not alive which causes no experience in us. Such a word, for example, we might say, is true. Probably one of the most abstract and powerful of all word thoughts. From the beginning of time, man has asked, what is truth? So he looks up this word, full of hope and optimism, and he finds in the dictionary that truth stands for reality or on another level, that a, a truth is a fact. So he ponders a little longer, and he looks up facts to see if he's on the right track. He looks it up in the dictionary, and he is told that a fact is a truth. <laughs> he is therefore captured. Now, if anyone should say, ask you what a truth is, you will probably explain to the best of your ability that it is something that is really so. But how much libido would there be behind the entire concept procedure? If someone in turn asks you what is really so, you will answer with another formula of words, perhaps by giving, giving an example. It is true that night follows day. It is true that water seeks its own level. These things are true, but what is true? All we have tried to do is to convey the impression of something factual. 
Now to the degree that we can escape from word limitation, we probably can bestow some dynamic upon a word. But today, this dynamic is utterly inadequate. And the only way in which we can learn and prove that we are learned is by remembering words. <clears throat> if we remember them as the professor told us, and then when he asks the question in an examination, we can write them out for him, we will pass the examination. What they mean, however, as living experience to us is exceedingly dim. And as a consequence of this, a large part of education has become exceedingly dull. It neither holds nor intrigues nor captures the mind. Now one of our great problems in words is the substitution of name for fact. A small boy points out of the window of the automobile and says, Daddy, what is that? Daddy replies quickly, easily, honestly, and completely, that, my boy, is a horse. What has he actually said? Factually, he has communicated to his child our general name for that particular quadruped. The boy knows absolutely nothing more about horse, however, than he did before. And that which he really knows about horse in this moment is what he has seen about horse. He saw the horse. That was important. From now on, he can identify the animal and the name, just as he might do it also from a series of alphabet blocks on which animals, birds, and other creatures are represented. But all of this moves on a level. It moves on a strange, dead level. We define appearances. We create names for new appearances. We put chemicals together in a new compound and then create a name for them by stringing out, either with or without hyphens, the names of the elements of the compound. Thus we convey a certain factuality about the matter, but always on the level of words. And in a world of living mysteries, we have sought to explain everything by naming elements naming factors, naming relationships. This naming process is, however, merely an instrument or a tool. It is a means, but man has gradually come to accept it as an end, so that he is now confident that if he can name the thing, he knows it. If he can communicate this name, he communicates learning. Actually, this entire procedure stimulates mostly memory, and the individual becomes profoundly burdened with names and words. Not long ago, we were discussing with a scholar the terrible profundity of the Chinese language. The Chinese language is an ideoglyphic language. That is, the, char the characters of the language were originally pictoglyphs. They resemble the object which they defined. Thus, they have a little figure that looks like a tree, and that is a tree in their language. And if they put two trees together, that is many trees. If they put three trees together, that is a forest or a vast accumulation of trees. Thus, by a simple symbolic procedure, they have created a symbol for an idea. They have a symbol for woman and a symbol for home. And if they put the woman symbol together with the home symbol or house symbol, then they have the concept of home as we know it, a psychological abode of persons united in certain interests. A woman in a house equals a home. Two women under the same roof equals chaos in Chinese. And it is not entirely inaccurate. So, through experience, these glyphs have been devised. And my friend was concerned. He said, how have the Chinese ever learned 
to write and read a language in which there are more than 13,000 arbitrary glyphs and characters. Seems a preposterous undertaking. Well, the Chinese were very simple people in comparison to ourselves. Today, the average individual uses from 10 to 20,000 word forms. And these word forms for him must be memorized, must be accepted, must be available just exactly like the Chinese ideoglyphs. And if he is a scholar, he may need 50,000 of these word forms. Now we say that um, uh, because of language and structure, that we are able to grasp the words from their roots and so forth. The Chinese, however, do the same thing because they have stems and they have basic patterns which they develop, develop their word glyphs from. Actually, however, our use of language today depends upon our automatic memory of these word signs, these word symbols, which we can combine into an infinite diversity of patterns. And if we are clever and skillful in this, we have an able and available vocabulary. Now a vocabulary, unfortunately, to modern man, does not represent an equally abundant reservoir of ideas. Today our greatest technicians in words often have the least to say, but they say it magnificently. Other individuals limited in vocabulary may have a much greater quotient of ideas. So today, in most things, we follow the Aristotelian concept that if we have enough words available, we can control nearly any intellectual situation. Whether these words are backed by adequate ideas, not only has not been given proper consideration, but to the average person is meaningless. His entire concept of life today is upon surfaces. And if he can convey surface adequacy, what lies beneath is of slight concern to him. Not only, however, do we have this problem of words, but of course we have gradually developed our confusion of tongues, where we have many languages and dialects by which means of communication are restricted to groups and classes and areas. And while gradually this is being overcome, it is a slow and difficult procedure. Because of this language barrier, the ideas of mankind have been kept separate for a very long period of history, in fact since the beginning of history. All these things have a bearing upon our major problem today because they point out that when we sit down to read a book, whatever that book may be, we are forced to consider our own ability, the difficulty in the transmission of ideas, and to a measure, of course, the authenticity or adequacy of the author. We must not confuse a well-turned phrase for a well-matured thought, and we all do it. We must not assume that because an individual has reputation that he has true knowledge. And not having these general criteria to base our judgment upon, we turn dismally from the realization that we are in no position to estimate the integrity of the work, nor the validity of its premises. So the book comes to us from an unknown source. It comes to us far more limited uh, than its original message might imply. For example, today we pick up an available translation of Plato. Here was a man who lived 2,400 years ago. Even with the most brutal mistranslation and inadequate interpretation, we observe traces of an extraordinary brilliance of mind, and a depth of penetration, and a largeness of spirit, all of which intrigue us. We must then consider what has happened to Plato. 
Let us remember also that most of these things which we now preserve of his were originally dialogues, that they were conversations, and that these conversations were nearly always, in one way or another, punctuated by mannerism. Ancient man conveyed more by the tone of his voice, by the inflections that he used, by a motion of his head, by a wry smile while speaking, by the raising of an eyebrow at a critical moment in discussion. These things carried overtones which cannot be carried in the printed or written word. Therefore, the voice, its persuasiveness, its melancholy, its depth, its hushed and muted whisper, all these different qualities by which we can awaken emotion, awaken reaction, point up, emphasize, all these are missing after the person who spoke has departed from this world of ours. We may be in a little better condition in the future because from now on we can keep in actual tonal form the words of great people, but the ancients did not have this skill. So today we have only a written, stenographic type of account of things that were said and done long ago. Now we have also the problem of language. Plato spoke one of the most learned languages of the world, what we call classical Greek. It was a magnificent language, but an astonishingly simple one. A language so simple that were we restricted today to its vocabulary, we would regard ourselves as underprivileged. And yet, with this limitation, it had certain insistences, certain values. And because it was not a total language as we think of it, it was a constant challenge to the listener. Where your written forms are inadequate, where your spoken forms are restricted, one word must mean many things. And the listener must immediately determine by an action of his own what meaning is required. Today we have lost even that exercise. Today we have words that will shade almost any idea, so that it is no longer necessary for us to be alert to try to capture the meaning of these words. So we have the translation from Greek into English, and we have the rising personality of the translator. A translator in this case who lived nearly 2,000 years or away from the original. A translator who is not Greek, who did not live in their culture, who does not know their idiom, who has no way of appreciating what Plato really thought. By gradual process of induction and deduction, the translation takes on the appearance of what a scholar in 18th or 19th century England believed Plato to mean when Plato spoke 2400 years ago in Athens. Now this in itself presents a very large mystery because we, are, we cannot be sure, we have no way of knowing, to what degree the interpreter, the translator, by his own inevitable choosing, has selected terms which seem to him reasonable. He may be perfectly conscientious, completely honest, but he is still himself. And as in the case of dear old Dr. Jowett, who did one of the great translations of Plato, Dr. Jowett was honest, honorable, sincere, and a devout member of the Church of England. Plato knew nothing about the Church of England. And the Church of England does not, generally speaking, know too much about Plato. <laughs> so the combination is not entirely satisfactory. But assuming that Jowett did the best he could, and rescued perhaps 60, 70, 80 percent accuracy in his own interpretation of Plato's meaning. Now comes the next important equation, and that is the reader. The reader lives just another hundred years or further away from Plato than Dr. Jowett did. 
Also, the reader does not have Dr. Jowett's lifetime of research and study at Barwell College in Oxford. The average reader is not a person totally, completely devoted to classical learning. He has very little actual, vital concept of Greek life. He has no immediate familiarity with the abstract speculations of Plato's mind. So he reads. And instead of bringing uh, to the uh, message the limitation that Dr. Jowett brought, who was limited by the fact that he only had 70 years of philosophy to live by, the modern reader picks it up with the additional limitation that he has about 15 minutes of philosophy to <laughs> convey and bestow from himself. Now, this is not universally true. Some people may have studied quite intensively and quite industriously from various interpretations, various translations. They have tried. They have been thoughtful. But they have also learned by now that the different translations that they have read were not in agreement. And therefore, there is a considerable uh, interval here. But actually, presuming that we are reading and presuming that we were reading the correct words, the actual words spoken by Plato, and that we had a full grammatical knowledge of the structure and the meaning of those words, still, what have we to give out of ourselves to make these words come alive so that they are not any longer merely collections of letters that have to be sought out in a dictionary. When Plato refers to the mind in some context, do we have a living concept of what mind is? Or do we merely regard it as some mysterious assembly of factors uh, operating through the brain? or in some way associated to the brain. When we look up mind in the dictionary and find intellect as a meaning, are we advanced? Or if we look up intellect and discover that it is a manifestation of the mind, where are we? We are dealing on our own level with ideas that have not been experienced or known as living facts within ourselves. Therefore, we cannot depend upon these words to bestow living facts. This brings us into another interesting equation. We learned from Pythagoras nearly 2,600 years ago that the definitions of things are best attained from the intervals between them and not from the things themselves. In this case, the intervals represent spacing and words. Various words leading up to a word. Various words dependent upon a word. Usage, arrangement, organization, and what we might term text structure. These things help us in a new way, because by combining words we develop a certain vitality, and in the total idea we may find something that stimulates and stirs us where words would not. Thus whatever stimulation we get from words is not from the words themselves, but from their relationships. And through their relationships, Words impel a concept or imply an idea. And an idea is a luminous sense of sudden awareness. The word becomes meaningful because of association. And because of this sudden meaningfulness from within ourselves, we come into acceptance or rejection, if we are not very learned, and if we are more learned, we come into consideration of the statement that has been made. If we are very, very gullible, we will accept. If we are very skeptical, we may reject. Both courses are unprofitable. 
If, however, we are sufficiently intelligent to consider and have something in the form of power which enables us to consider, then perhaps we shall be on the way toward uh, a broadening or deepening of some value within ourselves. Consideration means that we must have within our own nature some faculty or power that responds to the stimulus of an idea because no idea can have a meaning for us that in some way is not within our experience or within our own total ability to comprehend. If it is incomprehensible, it simply means that it does not awaken any reaction in ourselves, either of interest or of indifference. Then we learn by degrees that the great use of words is to draw something out of ourselves and that the text we read is a sort of catalyst, an agency, by means of which we see reflected in the words of others the ideas which are in ourselves. And learning is thus a drawing forth out of the internal of certain convictions which we hope to advance certain ideas which we hope to sustain, certain mysteries which we hope to solve. And reading on these levels becomes the basis of what we hope will prove to be an increase of knowledge or of an advancement of ourselves in some useful way. Now, of course, there are forms of reading uh, in which material is so technically presented and so obviously experienced around us, as in trades and crafts, that the combination of the text and instruction and apprenticeship still produces the skilled mechanic, still enables the person to grasp certain practices and policies, and thereby increase the probability of a successful livelihood. This is not the type of material with which we are primarily concerned at the moment, however because this is obviously supplemented by certain apprenticeship. Now, in abstract ideas, however, particularly as they relate to religion, philosophy, psychology, and things of that nature, one of our problems is the difficulty of apprenticeship. We have an increasing store of ideas, such as they are mostly derived from other sources, but certainly sustained by some strength within ourselves. We try to put these ideas to work, and we find that because they are not clearly defined in themselves, they do not produce a clearly defined consequence. We tell someone something for his own good. We use words. We hope he understands. He understands according to what he is, and he acts according to what he is. Perhaps our recommendation or suggestion stirs him into some action. Perhaps it does not. Perhaps the action which he makes is not actually consistent with the recommendation we made, because it is only his interpretation of it. But gradually, through a period of time, certain things happen. But by that time, the person who made the suggestion is no longer following the case history closely. He has made numerous other suggestions and is in so many difficulties as a result that he does not have time to check any one of them. He gradually comes to the conclusion that he cannot clarify the consequences of his own ideas in action. And he is further hampered by the fact that the last person to whom he applies his ideas is himself. And yet he is the only one through whom he could get a case history. If he did it himself, he would know the results. But if he tosses it into society promiscuously, he will never know the results. Because it will be like a stone falling in water. It will leave a little ripple, sink to the bottom, and disappear from sight. Innumerable ideas have been swallowed up by the vast mass motions of humanity since the dawn of time. And it is difficult, indeed, to discriminate or determine 
the exact merit of these various ideas. Now when we come to literature or to the written word, we observe, however, that there has been a consistent kind of censorship down through time. Man reaching out for knowledge, seeking in the great written record of his people and now of the whole world, for some thing to advance his own patterns of living, has gradually exercised a censoring power over the productions of his fellow men. Those books which have survived from great ages, these texts, ideas, even quotations, truisms, aphorisms that have come down to us out of the remote past, most of these have lived because Future generations be, uh, to be born after their original statement have perpetuated these ideas. But man has carried them on, giving them life from his own vitality, because the original vitality ceased when the idea uh, was committed to the common mind. But the common mind preserved it, vitalized it, and perpetuated it, handing it down as valuable, useful, or important. <coughs> Where this has occurred over a long period of time, we have what is called authority. An authority, or the censorship of ages, involving both the nature, dignity, estate, and conduct of the originating source of the idea, plus the admiration in which it has been held over long periods of time. These together constitute a kind of recommendation which will influence the modern thinker or the modern seeker to assume that these ideas must be important. He will soon come to the realization, of course, that different kinds of ideas about the same thing have been so perpetuated, and therefore that the value of ideas is broken into schools of thought, and each school perpetuates that which it regards as most useful, necessary, or vital. Today, therefore, modern man comes into a literature of which probably some 20 to 25 million different pieces are available to him in many languages and relating to an infinity of subjects. He is in the presence of the accumulation of all past knowledge. While he does not realize it, he is also in possession within himself of a vast accumulation of past experience, moving through his bloodstream, moving through his psychic life. He believes in reincarnation, moving from previous existences, so that the individual today carries within himself a great deal of locked material. And very often reading is the way in which this submerged part, by association with some outward statement, is lured out of the unconscious or the subconscious and made available as a conscious instrument of man's purpose. So if knowledge is enormous, man's capacity to know is also growing. And the problem that always remains for him is to make a relationship between his own need and such available remedy as exists for him in the literary world. All of this, of course, takes not into consideration at all what we might term uh, non-philosophical uh, literature. Fiction, material relating to events imaginary or non-truthful, or the innumerable passing opinions of persons simply word facile we are not including. Only those things which have in themselves, presumably, some serious meaning. But let us not remove fiction as a possible means of education, inasmuch as fiction arising directly from imagination in man sometimes carries the most powerful of all moral fables, carries in many instances a greater dynamic uh, than prose, or of, than history or philosophy. The same is true of poetry, which may be more truthful than theology, simply because poetry represents a release. 
not bounded or held by certain censorship of the reason. Therefore, speaking more directly from the internal instincts, impulses, and intuitions of the individual. On the more serious side of reading, however, we know a little now about what our instruments are, what our problem is, and how each individual must be presumed to be able to solve it. The first thing that every reader must try to do to the best of his ability is to recover from this instinct of perpetual acceptance by autom automatic or autonomic procedure within himself. This problem of simply reading and reacting merely to words. He must, if he wishes to read profitably, he must try to experience reading in terms of the total consciousness of himself. For example, in recent years, speed reading has developed, in which an individual is able to skip a book almost in an incredibly short period of time. What the advantage is, other than perhaps in book reviewing or in something of that nature, is not quite clear. Because skim reading only makes the problem more superficial than it was before. Opposed to this is digesting, or the effort to extract from long and complicated works their essence, meaning, or substance, and placing this in a brief statement, making it directly available to the individual. This has some merits, for the reason that the average person's continuity is not great enough to, pre to perpetuate a very long chain of related sequences without the chain breaking somewhere. He just does not have this type of recollectingness within himself. So digesting may have merit. It may have certain limitations also. But it points out the important fact that if we cannot learn all that is contained in a work, it is better that we learn something clearly and definitely than to skim over much and retain little. So very often in digesting we strive for the keynotes or the, the high points of an, a long and difficult article and in this way make it available to the average person of restricted time and interest. These things will all do a great deal to influence modern reading. And modern reading today is in need of considerable influencing because it is largely indiscriminate. It is largely a reading according to fashion. It is a reading for pleasure rather than learning. It is a reading largely of, es of escape literature at a time when man should not be thinking as much of escape as he is of solution. So a lot of reading is not really intended to profit the person. And wonderful or strange as it may seem, unprofitable reading may have the greatest basic influence upon the individual. He may actually be more moved by the detective story than he is by a, a wide selection of learned and important works. The reason being that he has approached the detective story almost without prejudice, in a highly relaxed state, and is simply waiting to be entertained. This places him in a particularly receptive situation, whereas with a serious book, he is apt to approach it with prejudices, with restrictions, with fears, with doubts, misgivings concerning his own ability, and gradually perhaps develop an inferiority complex as he passes from page three to page four. <laughs> he, is, he, he no longer trusts himself after he listens or mentally hears a number of long words for which he has no adequate definition. All of these things influence reading habits and reading practices. 
reading cannot be and must not be a substitute for living. No individual can read so much that its total will ever equal experience. Actually reading is to supplement, to fill in, to help the individual because none of us can experience everything. But the moment reading becomes so heavy a practice, as it does with some people who are very studious and very well intentioned, that life becomes a vicarious existence bounded on every side by a book. If this happens, the whole character, the whole purpose of the individual is frustrated. Thus reading is not a substitute for living, it is not a substitute for the apprenticeship of doing, it is not a substitute for the sharing of ideas between living persons, nor is it a sure and inevitable solution to the reasonable doubt within yourself. Reading is therefore a useful auxiliary, but where it is accepted as a basis of ultimate solution to something, it is likely to prove most disappointing. Actually, many very solid thinkers in this field have taken the attitude that man should read primarily only in order to gain some information about facts or about circumstances that cannot be directly experienced by the person. The individual who cannot go to the place may read about it, but though he read about it for twenty years, he will not gain as full an estimation of that place as he would by an actual residence there for a few hours. There is the difference between the vicarious and the impact of the actual thing upon the complicated sensory mechanism of the individual. Reading does not use all of the sensory perceptions. It does not call into being the total consciousness assets of man. Therefore, it cannot result in a total vitalization of his nature. Now, reading under discretion and discrimination may impel the individual to an experience. The person who has read much and long about uh, the beauties and wonders of the Mediterranean islands may finally gain so strong an impulse that he insists upon going there. When he gets there, he finds that his reading has helped him, that it has helped to make this beautiful region more understandable to him. And he begins to recollect what he read about this place or what he read about that place. And each of these places becomes more important, more living, because he is able to place them in a reference frame that is adequate. So reading supplies forever this reference frame which will enrich the individual when he actually creates a factual experience situation. Always then we must think of reading in its ability to create reference frames that it should impel us always to action, never merely to the continuance of reading. In philosophy, reading of some important basic text should lead us to conviction, which is a kind of internal action. It should cause us to examine our own conviction, which is again an activity. It should help us to apply censorship upon our own errors, again an action. And if the reading proves to have been correct and the recommendations were right and practical, the individual should experience improvement and should sense that he is better equipped for life and action. Then he can call upon this experience from within himself in need, but he cannot call directly upon words and find any consolation in them. He cannot meet problems with words when this problem presents itself 
factually. Therefore, all words must be transmuted into living force within his own consciousness if they are to be useful to him in any emergency. This means that for the most part, we should read more slowly. Read less, but read carefully. But the advantage is not how many books we have read. The advantage lies in what we have been able to use, what we have been able to make our own through a positive process of assimilation, so that actually these words have become like the food that we eat. We are not nourished by the food, but by a certain vitality or vitamin within the food. We are not worry, uh, nourished by the words of our authors, but by a certain vitality, which if we can assimilate it, and can make it part of a living knowledge in ourselves, may be available to us when we need it most. Therefore, the proof of learning is the availability of sufficiency in time of stress. And unless this availability is there, the learning has been without profit or merit. Now all of us are in the same position or condition that De Quincey was in in the British Museum when he sat weeping at the reader's table. He was surrounded by them by more than four million books, and he knew that he could not live long enough to read them all. He knew that no matter how careful, how thoughtful he was, he would not be able to share in the experiences of all these different persons whose lives, whose attitudes, whose convictions, whose discoveries were recorded in this immense body of literature. Therefore, De Quincey concluded, as we must all conclude, that a certain censorship must be applied. That we cannot read all means that we must try to select that which is most useful, that which perhaps in one way or another is most applicable to our own problem. This calls for another development within our natures. Before we can know what kind of reading can serve us best, we must also know what is our greatest need. We cannot afford to take the time of reading a hundred books by the hope that one of them will help. We cannot afford this process of letting the book tell us what we need. We must have certain fields of need, certain recognized problems in their various orders of importance, and all things being equal, we must seek first that information which is first achieved will make the most immediate attainment in our lives or solve the most pressing problem. This means discrimination, organization of our own requirements, the recognition of our own weaknesses, the understanding of our own shortcomings so that we can select honestly and properly. Once we have decided by discrimination this particular issue, we then search for such literature as may have a bearing upon it. Now, how do we search for it? There are several ways. One of scholarship's most natural and common methods is by a certain form of detective procedure. Research programs and each individual searching, searching for the answer to a problem of his own becomes in this searching a research student. Each researcher takes hold of a simple thread and follows this thread through a labyrinth of complicated relationships. He finds, for example, that if he approaches a standard text upon his subject, that this standard text will be documented. As he reads through, he will find notes and footnotes, and he will find that in the paragraph relating to his problem, there will nearly always be a quotation or a note that this particular paragraph was derived from or based upon the works of a certain person. Or perhaps even more than this, the reader will be invited to consider a larger and fuller statement by someone else or in some other place. The reader then follows this, 
securing, if possible, the work referred to. And we'll learn that this work was the product of several persons perhaps working together, or arising at a certain time in the mental or intellectual life of the author, and that he in turn has enlarged upon this problem, and that he was brought first to its attention, or came first interested in it, as the result of still another person, whose name is now mentioned, perhaps, for the first time. And so, by degrees, we trace through the origin of the idea until we find out where it began, how it developed, and how the treatment that we know came into existence. In this procedure, we gradually get hold of all of the elements of an hypothesis, which in its original statement in the one popular book that we read may have had five lines leaving us hopeful but confused. Actually, as a result of a careful program of study, we can trace these lines and their thoughts and their substances. And if we trace them far enough, likely as not, we shall trace them to one of the half dozen basic sources of ideas in the world. We will find that these ideas were developed from, unfolded from, enriched from, and sometimes misrepresented from, one of these earlier texts. And as we go back on and on in our searching, we may very well gradually discover that practically everything that we know in Western knowledge, practically every important idea that we have, is traceable to maybe only a handful of basic thinkers. And that of these basic thinkers, the outstanding and most commonly referred to is Plato. Emerson came to that discovery when he realized and stated that all Western knowledge is merely Plato interpreted or misinterpreted. And this is essentially a truth. But out of our general study, perhaps over a period of three or four years, maybe a little longer, or if we're very, very clever at our uh, uh, technical approach to things, perhaps less. We will gradually sort out secondary and tertiary sources. We will begin to realize that most writers are more or less beggars who have built their writings from the crumbs from the great men's tables. We will learn that the great authorities have merely been restated, reinterpreted, and usually to a degree mutilated. And that so many books are not basic. They do not really represent the wisdom of the author, but merely his compiling skill from other sources of information. Now his compiling skill may be worth something, because it may assist us in seeing more clearly and more immediately something that would be deep, mysterious, and diffused through the writings of an earlier person. But little by little, we begin to recognize the importance of basic sources. Basic sources for the average Western man must, however, come into English before he can handle them. If he has other languages, he may be able to go behind the English. But for the most part, he must depend upon English versions of basic works. Here, various scholarships and recommendations along the way may assist him in the selection of the best available version in English of some noted and important original. And then having finally come back by degrees to his source material, the reader must roll up his sleeve, settle back, and say, this I must attack. I can no longer depend upon the 25 cent digest I can no longer depend upon the modern philosophical historian who writes me a chatty little story about Leibniz but tells me nothing essentially of what this man believed or why he believed it. So having found an intriguing subject, we must go back to the labor of source. And if we do not do that, we will most certainly ultimately mutilate our author we will come to conclusions inconsistent with him. Now another thing we find is that perhaps in our searching we are searching for only a single thing. Perhaps in our reading we are trying to prove 
that great persons through the ages held a belief which we regard to be valid. So we will quote and look for quotations from these persons, and we will carefully go through an elaborate work, noting nothing except that which bears particularly upon our point of interest. This is exceedingly dangerous and leads to an immediate eclecticism. It is dangerous because an author's statement, if he is a valid writer, is always as the consequence and result of a general pattern. He is thinking from a large total concept. And if this total concept is not understood, his isolated thoughts will not be consistent, nor will they represent it. So our idea must be oriented in its larger concept. Otherwise we may misquote the meaning of our author, even while we correctly quote his words. This is due again to the interval between thoughts and words, and the fact that words mean what they mean to the one who uses them and therefore may have a totally different meaning for Leibniz than the meaning they might have for Immanuel Kant. Thus we cannot merely quote words or accept sentences. We must work with total concepts, and in these things we can also, to a great degree, have help, because while these concepts make, might take years for us to analyze in their totality, there are basic texts in which these concepts are reduced to their essentials, in which we can study them with comparative clarity and ease. Thus we trace, follow, examine, and find in that way that reading becomes purposeful. We are not reading jogging along hoping we will find an idea, or hoping that this author has a better answer than that author for some problem that perturbs us. We are reading purposefully to determine the relationship of ideas, to prove or disprove, to strengthen or weaken essential concepts or patterns which have either inspired us to search for greater wisdom or so annoyed us that we must ultimately prove them to be untrue. These different attitudes all affect the reader and his reading. Today, the library has almost disappeared from the average American home. With it has gone those grand old monuments to ancestral literary tastes, such as the complete Dickens, the complete Thackeray, and the complete Scott. These things have gone. <clears throat> In their place today, instead of the family gathering around the literary work, it gathers around the television or the radio, or is out riding on the country or city roads bumper to bumper with the neighbor. This situation has had considerable effect upon reading tastes. Reading is not as easy to us as it used to be. We find this uh, disruption and interruption much easier. And because we have read less, we have lost a considerable amount of our own literary taste. Today, uh, the average person does not use words either well or pleasantly. He has lost the gentle art of conversation. He has lost the ability to be interesting to himself or anyone else without three or four cocktails. <laughs> Until he has unbridled his libido with alcoholic nutrition, he is unable to express himself. He is unable to simply share in a common interest of ideas. This is unfortunate because it has reduced our ability to gain through literal and factual interchange of ideas, and it has driven the student further and further into his book, and has made reading a difficult habit for an individual of the average walk of life who has not been trained in its use. He no longer understands it, he no longer finds joy and release in it, he no longer finds immediate self-improvement in it. Therefore his instincts have weakened gradually until they have become rather feeble in a great many instances. 
Now let us imagine that as students of these various important subjects, uh, that you would like to think in terms of a reading program, that how to use uh, the book to help your mind uh, to use its own faculties and functions more clearly. Remember, of course, that the mind, like every instrument of the body, is strengthened by use, and that there is a very great deal of difference between strengthening thought and strengthening memory. To strengthen memory, we just have to keep on remembering. That's what does it. But to strengthen thought, we have to keep on thinking. And that's a little more difficult. Especially when the world is constantly trying to do our thinking for us, as through propaganda and salesmanship, in which little by little policies are forced upon us, attitudes are required or demanded of us, until the individual's individuality is almost totally submerged. A thinker must be an individual. He must have certain faith and confidence in his own ability to reason. And he must have some proof occasionally that his ability is genuine. The reasonable things which he decides to do must be reasonable when they are done. They must prove themselves, justify themselves, and sustain themselves in action. But assuming that we have this desire to enrich the mind through good reading, then I think there are a certain number of very simple but general rules which we can remember and which will be of service. Namely, that reading, like eating, exercise, and work, must be consistent, must be regular, and must be neither over excessive, must not be too much nor too little. The average person must learn how much reading it helps him and how much actually only obscures him or makes his thinking more difficult. The average person cannot read a sober text of serious import for a long time without fatigue. He is not supposed to. And reading to the exclusion of common activity will never be very profitable. It will produce the bookworm, but it will not produce the thinker. Therefore, we can say that the best way to read, the best way to study, is to set aside, according to the plan and need of living, certain times, a certain limited and restricted time that does not work a hardship upon the family or does not overbalance the well-being of the individual himself. Generally, in serious reading, a half hour is approximately the correct length of time. Because beyond a half hour, the individual, with only a printed page to inspire him, will lose acuteness of function. If he is highly trained and has perhaps advanced already a long way in the subject, he might be able to hold out for an hour. But that is just about his maximum. As a beginner, 15 minutes may take all that he can really do and after that, he is only reading words. They may interest him a little, but he has passed beyond the vital power to experience them, the moment reading fatigue sets in. So we generally recommend that a person who wants to be a fairly good student, but with a busy life in other fields in which he must make his living and meet his responsibilities, should, if situations permit, set aside approximately a half hour, if possible daily, if this is not possible at regular intervals, perhaps at the weekend, or whatever time is most suitable, and that if his opportunities are highly restricted, so that perhaps only on Saturday or Sunday can he do these things, then it would be advisable for him to take two periods at this time broken in some way. For instance, a half hour in the morning, a half hour in the evening. Do not, however, overdo it. Leave the intellectual table as you would the physical table, still hungry. 
and recognize that during the intervals in which you are not studying, you may be subconsciously working with what you have studied. Also, if you are studying a long and complicated work, break when you come to an important idea. Do not try to carry two new important ideas at one time. If it seems that you have reached a critical point, a high point, in the reasoning of this individual that you are reading, in which many valuable ideas have come together to form a focus of basic concept, pause there. Think about it. Reread it if necessary. Sometimes it is better to read the same paragraph every day for a week. Make sure that what you have found important, you are really gaining knowledge from. The moment you read a new idea, interpret it in terms of such experience as you can bring to bear upon it. How does your own life sustain this idea? How do your observations of other people sustain this idea? Is it workable in your own particular case? Is it workable in some other case that you know about? Is it according to approved working knowledge of persons who have achieved outstandingly in this idea or in this specialization? Always contemplation so that reading should be accompanied by thoughtfulness. The good reader very often lowers his page, closes his eyes, and thinks about what he has read, thus giving himself a certain energy, a certain participation in the process of thinking. Normally speaking, it is not good to read two works relating to conflicting schools of thought at the same time. If you have finally digested one author, and you wish in honesty to say there must be another side to this, let's see what the opposite side has to say, then also give your full attention to the opposite side. Do not compare them page by page or concept by concept. Compare them in ter terms of total viewpoint. And after you have established the total equation upon which they are functioning, you can then decide which one is more suitable to you. It is not a case of which one is true or which one is untrue. The average person is simply not capable of that decision. The problem is, is it useful, is it acceptable now? If not, hold it in suspension. Do not decide. Because tomorrow your own growth may change your attitude on many things. But having found that which meets need, use it. And if after the end of a considerable period of reading and study, you find you are the same person you were when you started, then something is wrong. You have not gained. You have not built. You have not become. Therefore, you are a word reader. You are simply taking the external of it. You're not getting into it and making it your own. This probably means haste, for one thing. Or it means that your own essential knowledge of the meaning of words is not adequate. Or it may mean carelessness or indifference or the, or the permitting of interruption to break into sequences of thought. Most likely it is because you have not taken these pauses for consideration. You have gone on reading hoping that you are going to grasp the secret of the ages and you have not paused to contemplate step by step the meaning of things. The greatest experience in the reading of a highly systematized work of a great thinker, like Plato or even Aristotle, or one of the basic philosophers of the world, Immanuel Kant, or perhaps one of the greater oriental philosophers like, Socrates, uh, like uh, Confucius or Buddha, the great experience is the unfoldment of the continuity because step by step they should lead you from what is obvious to that which is not quite so obvious but which becomes more obvious under consideration until by degrees you have disciplined your mind in a pattern. You have not learned nearly what to think. You have learned how to unfold an idea in sequence. And the most valuable lesson you may learn from a complicated study 
is methodology, the orderly consideration of the unfoldment of ideas. This orderly arrangement will induce you to an orderly course in the consideration of your own problems. It will help you to attack something necessary in an orderly, sequential, reasonable manner. If you jump over too many of the intermediate processes in ideas, you will lose continuity and ultimately it may come to an erroneous conclusion with no way to correct yourself. But if you consistently unfold the idea in its reasonable and natural manner, step by step, you will ultimately realize why the author, why the philosopher came to this conclusion, or if you feel that his judgment is wrong, you will have a particular and definite way of knowing why you think it is wrong. And your own thinking may be very vital on that problem, but it must be your own thinking and not merely opinion. It must be because you have traced the procedure in a sequential manner. Thus reading, when you really want to learn that way, is not an easy problem. It is not a substitute for going to school. It is not the quick way of doing something. But it is a highly rewarding way because it escapes from mass educational procedure, which is always slow and awkward. And the individual can become his own teacher to a great degree, can make the assignments as a professor would make them solve these assignments, prepare his thesis, do everything that he would do in an institution of learning. He will also learn how to document, to prove, to integrate, and to organize his own concepts. He may not need this documentation for himself, but if in turn he should wish to try to convey knowledge to another, the conveying of knowledge is just an exact science as the learning of it. And many persons are very unhappy and frustrated in this world because others will not accept or understand them. This is largely due to lack of organized conveyance. The individual has not recognized how to build a logical case for his own idea, has not presented step by step the facts in a manner in which they could be accepted by another person. When we burst a total concept on another uninitiated individual, we demand from them only one thing, flat acceptance or flat rejection. And if the individual is at all in trouble, which is usually the case or we wouldn't help him, his condition of mind is such that the flat rejection is most likely or if the flat acceptance is given, it is given without meaning and without purpose and leads to no action. If, however, instead of demanding that people shall agree with us or disagree with us, which is the uh, poor man's way of attempting to do a good deed, the right problem is to so possess our ideas or be so possessed by them that we can unfold them sequentially convincing reasonable minds of the reasonableness of our own position. And if we do this, our power to assist others is greatly enhanced. And we discover that our opinions and beliefs and attitudes are given more weight because it is obvious that we are master of them, that we have arrived at them by intent and not by accident and in a sense that we possess ideas and are not merely obsessed by them. By such procedure, our ability to communicate is therefore strengthened and enriched. And we make another important discovery, that never do we learn as fast as when we are communicating. A matter and material which has not been clear to us, perhaps, in its totality, becomes increasingly clear when we tell it to another. Thus we find resources within ourselves. Reading should therefore teach us that there are some books which we enjoy reading and we get something from them. And there are others that are very difficult and sometimes we give them up in despair. Let us imagine now that we ourselves are like these books and passing on our ideas to others. 
some of us can present ideas in a likable, acceptable manner because we are clear, concise, and orderly. Others of us cannot do this because by the time we have told our story, it is so difficult, so dismal, and so depressing in the method of communication that no one wants it. Yet we might have some truth in it if we could present it in a, a proper and reasonable and factual manner. Thus reading helps us to talk. It helps us to speak. It helps us to convey thought on to others. It is a gradual instruction in the total concept of communication. And not only must others communicate with us with reasonable hope of honesty on our part, but we must also communicate with others with a reasonable hope of being understood. This means simplification, clarification, organization. And through study we gain facility in these things. Thus we learn not only just to find an immediate answer to an immediate question. We learn in order to get a total concept of a total need in life. And when we approach it this way, we become better students. And we also are truer to the great sources of inspiration, the great scriptural writings, the foundation works of our race, upon which we so greatly depend for our inspiration and our understanding. Thus we honor our author when we read him wisely. And we honor our gods when we unfold the consciousness within ourselves through orderly disciplines. And reading can be such a discipline. In fact, it is more important to learn how to read than the very content of the thing we read. It is much more important for us to have this vital ability to put life back into symbols, to make them living monuments to ideas, so that each word that we read immediately comes alive and becomes meaningful as a phase of consciousness. Working in this way and to this end, the combination of the mind and the book will result in the creation, the generation of living ideas. But if this generation is frustrated by an inept or inadequate union, we then do not have the vital consequence which we most desire. Therefore, read thoughtfully, read carefully, read wisely, and read lovingly, and at the same time, patiently, realizing that we grow quietly and slowly, and that each step must be surely taken. And by so pursuing our way, we discover ultimately that we are teachers because we can communicate in an orderly manner those ideas which have becoming, become living facts within our own consciousness. Thus we are capable of making an individual contribution and we are also capable of perpetuating the great contributions which we so deeply admire and about which we have so positive a spirit of living veneration. Well, time's up.